I want to break free. Ready to break free? Take your dream vacation with Norwegian Cruise Line to Europe, the Caribbean, and more. Book today and get 50% off all cruises all over the world. Plus, enjoy free airfare for second guests, free unlimited open bar, free specialty dining, and more. Visit ncl.com, call your travel advisor, or 1-888-NCL-CRUISE. Offer ends soon. Norwegian Cruise Line. Sail safe. Feel free. Ships Registry, the Bahamas and USA. Restrictions apply. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is officially live. Now you can legally bet on all your favorite sports anytime and anywhere, right here in Ohio with DraftKings. For a limited time, new customers who sign up with code DEFEND and bet $5 or more will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. DraftKings has the best features including same-game parlays, player props, and more, with fast and easy payouts right at your fingertips. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers can use promo code DEFEND to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code DEFEND. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 21 and over and physically present in Ohio. Valid one offer per first-time depositors who have not already redeemed $200 in free bets via pre-launch offer. Minimum $5 deposit and wager. $200 issued as bonus bets. Eligibility restrictions apply. See dkng.co slash oh for terms. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Uh, today's episode is a little different. If you saw the title, which I'm sure you did if you're listening to it, it was How to Pay for Your Adventures. And basically what I want to do, we, we, we did a survey a couple weeks ago or months ago, and one of the main questions that got brought up in that survey or one of the things y'all wanted to know was a little bit more about uh, how people pay for these trips. We hear about so many amazing adventures all around the world. Uh, one of the questions I historically haven't asked consistently is how they pay for them or how is their life set up to make these financially possible uh, or the time possible to do this? And how do they take off the time and not lose the money? Like, how does that all work? And it's different for everybody. And there are plenty of them, uh, plenty of guests over the years that I've asked. Uh, and if you've noticed, I've started asking that more based on the survey. Uh, one, because I think it's really helpful. Uh, two, I think it breaks down some misconceptions about how a lot of these trips get paid for. And three, as someone that works in marketing and has been on the side of fundraising for adventures and also being pitched a lot for adventures, a lot of people ask me uh, with my day job at Athletic Brewing about, um, hey, hey, can y'all help out in any way? So I kind of wanted to put together just some basic tips and things I've learned over the years. And I've tried to write out everything I was I was thinking, and there might be some stuff that pops up. I, I'm guarantee what's going to happen is I'm going to click end on recording this. And then like 15 things flood my brain with uh, <laughs> more, more, more ways to save for adventures. So, but I'm going to go with, uh, at least start with what I have. And there, there, I, we asked folks for questions, listeners for questions. So we do have some questions about it and we're going to listen to those and uh, answer those at the end. Uh, so if you ask a question, be listening for the end. And by the way, I don't do a ton of monologues, so I, I really don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how uh, clunky it's going to sound or if it's going to be smooth, but I'm going to try to keep a straight line of thought through all this and not jump around like I would if I was talking to you in person. Uh, so, you know, I, I for, for 400 episodes, 500 episodes, I have bounced off a guest there have maybe been two or three episodes and all of that that it's just been me talking. That's not typically how I like to work. I like to work off of somebody and uh, ask questions and listen most of the time. I try not to even do a lot of talking on the show. Uh, there's a whole philosophy behind that that I can tell you more about at some point, but not not right now because I need to tell you how to pay for adventures. So why don't we go ahead and jump in? Um, how to get adventures funded, how to make these adventures in your life more possible, whether it's making the most of your weekends, making the most of your time off. If you have a job, like personal time off, 
Uh, if you're a teacher and have, you know, extended periods off, uh, that's a really great job for that. I think we talk to a lot of people on this show that are teachers. And although you don't get paid as much as a lot of other jobs, uh, there are a lot of just built-in benefits with the time off that's really uh, r- really a hard part because there's plenty of people that have great jobs in the sense of financial uh, uh, compensation. They get paid a lot for their job, but it also demands way more than 40 hours of them uh, a week. And frankly, it's hard to take time off. And, and I'm married to a teacher, so I absolutely know it's hard even then to take time off um, for times you're not working and you're putting in way more hours outside of school for a lot of teachers. So, so I understand it. There's definitely uh, a lot to consider with, uh, the, the amount of time that you have to do an adventure. And so, you know, asking yourself, you know, what you want to do, what kind of trip you want to do, that's all going to have a huge effect on the overall cost of the trip. You know, if this is, uh, something really cheap to pull off, like, uh, you know, backpacking or bikepacking or something where it's not, you know, a polar ex- expedition, uh, no engines are involved. You know, if you're overlanding for six months and you're driving every day and using up diesel or using up fuel and car parts or something like that, that can really add up. Those kinds of trips can really add up or trips that involve a ton of logistics with a lot of different people and really, really high uh, cost of entry with, you know, very, very specialized gear, something like ocean rowing across the ocean. That's going to be really pricey in the sense of the boat you have to buy when you first get into it. But again, you know, it's whatever you want to do. So the first thing I want to bring up is cutting out costs of your lifestyle. A lot of this, you know, if you're someone that's, you know, financially minded or or budgetarily minded, uh, like I typically am, a lot of this is just going to seem like basic stuff, but what you're going to learn is it's not it's not really complicated. It's just it's I don't have a ton of tricks up my sleeve or a ton of you know tax write off ideas or any sort of uh, experience or ex, uh, expert knowledge sub in, in any subject matter around here. It's just really following the basics and doing that consistently over time are going to allow you some freedom in your time and freedom in your budget to make these adventures happen. So the first thing is cutting out costs of your lifestyle. You know, when with doing that, keep in mind, it's not saying that you should live absolutely as frugally as possible. Now, if you want to do that, go for it. There's definitely been times in my life that I've done that. But one thing that I'll say when cutting things out of your life, it's like, you know, finding ways to lower your bills, finding ways to share your bills, finding ways to incorporate not only cutting down on the finances, but doubling with training. So like, say you're going to do a big bike trip, uh, cut out three days a week, have your commute be riding your bike to work. Uh, or, or if you work from home, spending that time, like doing running errands by bicycle, you know, little things like going to the grocery store, going to the post office, things you have to do anyway, incorporate some sort of training with that. Uh, building it in and just being efficient in that sense. But one thing with cutting out things out of your lifestyle, keep in mind, keep one or two things in your budget that might be beneficial to making this adventure happen. One could be, for example, I rent a co-working space. Uh, I don't have to do that, uh, but I do that because I work from home. But I do it because I I enjoy interacting with other people. That gives me a lot of energy. That gives me a lot of uh, ideas uh, when I just talk to people between meetings and just when I'm, you know, in the little kitchenette here making coffee and just meeting new folks, that gives me a lot of energy and a lot of uh, joy. And so that's something even when I'm saving for adventure, I would probably keep because because of those reasons I listed, but also um, because it would give me an opportunity to basically bike here. It's not that far from my house and I could use it as training and also it gives me more people to tell about the adventure. That's going to be coming up later. Um, another thing is like a gym membership, stuff like that. I've known a lot of people uh, who are saving up for an adventure who keep a gym membership because it's like, Hey, this is the one thing. Oh, this is one thing that helps me get ready for this lifestyle. And uh, a lot of times you can get really good deals on gym memberships, you know, like Planet Fitness is like 10 bucks a month. And I think it's been 10 bucks a month for like 30 years. How they're doing it, I don't know. Them and the Arizona Iced Tea 99 cent can. I don't know how they're doing it after 30 years, but they're doing it. So 
Uh, shout out to Planet Fitness. I don't have a gym membership, uh, but if you wanted to go with one, that's a great one because it's you know going to be helping you get in shape, um, but also helping you to uh, stay motivated and getting ready for this adventure um, and totally worth the cost. Another big cost is uh, anything with payments, anything that's going to accrue debt, anything that uh, has an engine is going to depreciate over time. Try to keep those costs very, very low. You know, I've been a big fan. I've had two vehicles in my life, and that is one way you can really eliminate a lot of headache. I know cars are just outrageous right now, um, but if you're going to need a vehicle to live your lifestyle, you know, I say go for something cheap. You know, just go for an old clunker. I th- I think of vehicles as appliances. Like, I-, I-, I treat my truck the same way I would treat my washing machine. I don't think of one as better than the other. I think of two, basically two different washing machines fulfilling two different purposes. <laughs> now, I love my truck. Don't get me wrong. But I paid very minimal for it, and I maintain it so that it runs. That's all it is to me. Um, the reasoning is housing, housing, vehicles, and there's a few other things that, that really are the anchors of your budget. If you have those things under relative control, there's a lot more freedom in your budget, uh, especially here in the U S where we're very car dependent. Uh, if you can keep the cost of your vehicle low, you know, there, I, I'll just put it this way. There's a lot of people I respect. There's a lot of people I admire uh, their their philosophy of life and how they do adventures or how they uh, just live their lifestyle or treat other people. And then I see what they drive and it makes a lot of sense. You know, they're just, that is not a big concern with their life. They see other things as being much more, uh, a, they can put a lot more energy into other things in their life, like l- relationships, uh, the time they can spend doing trips and they get a lot more out of it than the amount of money and time that can go into vehicles. So I would say avoid uh, vehicle payments all you can. And you might be saying, uh, you know, Mason, this is 2023. The economy's haywire. Uh, things are, you know, 15 more percent more expensive than they were last year. Trust me, I'm there too. I've got two small kids at home. Uh, just bought a vehicle for my wife. I, I'm there. You know, I've got all the, the trapping responsibilities of a modern life. Um but if you're at a point where you're thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I need something new. Maybe there's, uh, you know, maybe that's going to open up some doors for me. Well, I, I would con- reconsider and just see what you can do uh, to keep your vehicle running uh, without putting tons and tons of money into it or into a new one. And here's a really fun fact that I learned uh, a couple weeks ago is that the average vehicle here in the U.S., the average age of the average vehicle uh, on the road is 13 years. So, and it's getting older all the time. And the reason is because while well, vehicle vehicles can last longer than they used to, but also people are realizing that it's going to be a lot less money to keep a vehicle running longer than it is to buy a new one. And, t- and in taking the environment into consideration, uh, you know, having something run longer that's already been created is a lot of times less of an environmental impact than buying something newer, uh, not always, actually. It's actually pretty surprising that sometimes buying a new car is the better thing to do than just continue driving an old one uh, because of how much more uh, fuel efficient it is and how much le- how, how much less emissions there are. It all depends on the vehicle, but you know, take that into consideration as well. Another really big chunk in co- cost of your lifestyle is housing. And here, I mean, there's a lot of ways to be creative from having roommates uh, to you know, house sharing or, uh, you know, buying something used and fixing it up and kind of putting in a lot of that sweat equity yourself, or just, you know, moving somewhere that is a little less desirable to save, uh, save money. Like I, I, you know, it really is up to you. I've kind of taken that approach. Like I, I bought a really old fixer upper. Now it does come back to bite me. Sometimes it's been a little more costly to fix it up than I realized. Uh, but still, on average, our mortgage is way lower than than most people, and uh, we're also paying it off a lot faster than a lot of folks. And that's just because I know uh, from vehicles and housing, those are the two biggest costs a lot of times in people's budgets. Uh, another one, a big one that has a, you know have a lot of control over is food. Uh, you can really be creative with food and what you can uh, save and what you can uh, cut down on there. I could spend forever talking about ways to save money on lifestyle, but really it comes down to who you are and what you want to do. And there's like, there's 
thousands, if not millions of techniques you can use. But, you know, I'm not going to go into the details about my life because there's going to be, you know, few people that apply to or try to go over all of them because it's just too many to go over. So do the research yourself in the ways to, to save money on your own lifestyle. Uh, but one thing I have had experiences is cutting out costs of the actual adventures too. Uh, something to consider with adventures is, you know, like I said before, they can range drastically in how expensive they are based on what kind of sport it is, travel, you like, are, are you starting near home? Or are you fly, having to fly halfway around the world to do this adventure? Take all that into consideration as well, uh, because you can do some amazing adventures really cheaply by making home either a starting point or an ending point to cut out one side of the travel cost equation. You know, I've been, I've done a lot of trips and I, I've actually tied that strategy into a lot of them. When I, my first big trip, when I flew to Alaska, I only had one plane ticket. It was fly to Alaska, bring my stuff, uh, bring my bike and all that, and then bike home. Home was the destination. So as I got closer, uh, it was a lot easier to stay motivated uh, because, you know, I was getting close to home. But also that cut out half the travel costs is literally uh, my plane ticket was half of probably what it could be. And as a college student, a, a 20-year-old at the time, that, that was a big deal, you know, saving five dollars was a big deal saving twenty dollars was a huge deal saving a hundred dollars was the difference between making the trip happen or not um now thankfully that's i i can be a little more you know a little more flexible with my budget but uh there are downsides to that because i I can tend to spend a lot more than i should on adventures if i'm not careful just because it's there but i have a lot more responsibilities now too so i gotta weigh all that so like i said the second thing is cutting out costs of the actual adventure Travel is a big, big part. I've found getting to or from an adventure is probably the biggest expense outside of the equipment itself. And that brings up a great point. Equipment. There are so many ways to save on gear. And again, this is all about the adventure you're doing. If you are doing a very specialized climbing experience, you know, adventure somewhere, uh, you know, halfway around the world, you're going to need really good climbing gear, probably not used stuff. Probably not, you know, some rope you find somewhere. You're going to need certain things that you just can't get around. Those are just sunk costs, you know, something that you absolutely have to have for this trip. Travel, you know, air travel, of course. Some ways you can cut down on travel, I'll go back to that real quick, is incorporating ways to add that into the adventure. Everything from hitchhiking, which I'm a fan of. I still hitchhike. I have plenty of times to get to and fro starting points of adventures, Uh, but also... Uh, you, hitchhiking in a way that like isn't so dangerous. You know, you can find people who are driving somewhere, truck drivers, uh, friends of friends or family who say, you know, I'm actually having to go on this road trip for work. Give them, you know, 50 bucks or pay for some gas for them to take you. It gives them something really interesting to do and gives you a really, you know, kind of, kind of an adventure within an adventure. I actually did that one time when I needed to go spend a summer at a summer camp, my stepdad was a truck driver at the time. And I said, Hey, can I just ride with you? You're going to be going within 20 miles of where I need to go. It's going to take me a couple extra days, but I'm in college at the time. I had the time off and I just rode with him around the country a couple days, seeing parts of the country I'd never seen. And then he drops me off. And one of the counselors from camp was totally willing to come get me 20 minutes out of the, out of camp uh, and drive me back. And that saved me probably at the time, a three $300 plane ticket. Uh, so that's one way is incorporating some sort of getting there as an adventure itself. If you have the time to do that, that's a great way to save some money, but also create some memories as well. Um, other ways to cut costs out of the adventure, I mentioned this before, uh, because not all adventures cost the same, really dive into if you can spend some time looking for used gear. This has probably been one of my best skills is saving money on the gear, whether that be completely completely cheap stuff or a combination of things that I know I want brand new or that need to be brand new and other things that just don't have to be brand new. Great example. A lot of my trips have involved bicycles. You don't need a brand new bike. 
Uh, I have had some brand new bikes and I've had some used bikes for my adventures. The great thing is if you do get a quality bike, it's going to last you, you know, a really long time if you take care of it. Um, but if all you've got is money for a $50 bike from Goodwill, guess what? That can be a really cool marketable aspect of your adventure. You can say, Hey, I'm doing this on a $50 bicycle. That can almost be a reason why people follow along or a reason that your trip is unique uh, and something to lean into rather than something to lean away from. So gear, Uh, let me dive into this a little bit more. I've learned that with tents like camping tents, price doesn't matter that much as far as like keeping rain out or uh, durability. Really what you're paying for, in my opinion, when you pay for a really expensive tent is less weight. And so unless you're backpacking or fast packing or something like that, if you can get by with carrying a little more weight, you can get a super cheap tent from a yard sale or Goodwill or somewhere like Walmart or Amazon. Uh, Very inexpensive tent that's, in my opinion, just as good of a quality as a really high-end tent that's hundreds of dollars less. Something that maybe is worth going a little bit more for, uh, especially if you're going to be somewhere cold, are sleeping bags. I've found that a good quality sleeping bag uh, is really nice to have uh, when it's cold out and uh, for packability and for weight. Uh, But again, if that's something that's going to be an issue for you, you can find a really good middle of the road sleeping bag that's not too expensive, uh, but is going to get you, uh, you know, get be comfortable for you. And the one I use right now is pretty inexpensive. Honestly, I just camped last night, literally last night with it in freezing weather, uh, right at about freezing cold here in Florida, which is really rare for us. Uh, and I was, you know, I was a little chilly, but you know, I had, I had some clothes on underneath and uh, I had some tactics that I used to stay warm and I was fine. Uh, and I've had that sleeping bag six, seven years now. I've used it all over the country, all over the place, uh, many times in the last few months, and it serves me just fine. Uh, but again, I do want to say I'm not much of a gearhead. Like I, I don't know when I, I really don't pay a lot of attention to gear, and I don't talk to a lot of people about gear, just because I, I feel like there's so many people who can get so caught up in gear, uh, to where that's almost the reason they're into the sport, not necessarily the experience they're going to be having with it. In fact, some of my best stories and my favorite stories came from having bad gear or not having the gear that I needed. And so the lack of it led to some sort of problem I was facing, which led to a story, which led to something I can look back on really fondly and laugh about now. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. If eating healthier this new year has got you a little stressed out from the money, from the time, from the research of the recipes, well, guess what? HelloFresh is going to make it easy to eat well and save money this year. Cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right from your own kitchen. Just for full disclosure, I actually had a subscription of HelloFresh the last time, uh, our second baby when it, when he was born, uh, just to take that aspect of, of getting back to life out of our hands. You know, healthy food, easy-to-cook meals arrived right at our door, and I didn't do it forever, but I, it was so helpful for the time it did, and I think it's going to be really helpful this year with wanting to eat healthier. And it came in so handy for for that. So even if you're looking for, if someone's going through a lot or they just have a lot on their plate, maybe this is something you could gift someone too. That would be an awesome gift to someone who just had a baby or is going through something where, you know, you don't want to buy them fast food or takeout all the time, but you could get them really healthy meals delivered right to their house and they're very easy to cook and it's very satisfying to make it yourself. So if you're interested, go to HelloFresh.com slash ASP21 and use the code ASP21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. That's crazy. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash ASP for Adventure Sports Podcast. 21 and use the code ASP21 for 21 free meals plus shipping. 
Holy cow, that's a great deal. Check it out yourself, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. With the Kroger Plus card, it's easy to get lower than low prices. For the win! Earn fuel points on every purchase and save up to a dollar a gallon at the pump. The Kroger Plus card, all you do is win. Big, big savings. Sign up now at Kroger.com and start saving. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Fuel restrictions apply. Save more on natural and organic items. Just clip your digital coupons on our app and use them up to five times in one transaction with your card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. New customers, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code DEFEND to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you place a $5 bet on anything. That's code DEFEND, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 21 and over and physically present in Ohio. Valid one offer per first-time depositors who have not already redeemed $200 in free bets via pre-launch offer. Minimum $5 deposit and wager. $200 issued as bonus bets. Eligibility restrictions apply. See dkng.co slash oh for terms. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Uh, one, one example was I, I did a week on the Appalachian Trail with some friends in college. A lot of these trips I'm talking about are in college. Uh, I promise I've done more than just <laughs> work done stuff in college. But we're on the we're on the Appalachian Trail, and I'm like, you know, you know, it's it, I've, I've got this like windbreaker that was like my dad's or something or some a little bit heavier than that, but not much more heavy than a, a windbreaker. And it's like this old nineties jacket, poorly fitting. And I'm thinking, you know, this is fine. I'm going to be fine. I just got back from Alaska. I, you know what? North Carolina is nothing compared to that. And so I thought, and it was, it was Christmas break. I'll put it that way. Uh, so it could get really cold and being from Florida, I didn't know a whole lot about cold weather, even after uh, multiple trips to places in the snow. And about two days in, it had been raining, more like sleet, so freezing rain for a straight day. And I thought the first town, you know, after a whole day of that and being freezing cold and on the verge of tears, it felt like, I thought the first town we go to, I'm going into the nearest outdoor store and I'm buying a jacket. I don't care what it costs. I don't care. I I don't care. I'm going to go get a jacket. This is terrible. And so we get to this town. uh, It's really just a shop, like a general store next to the trail, and they sold some outdoor gear. And thankfully, they had North Face down jacket. So down is, you know, a type of insulation, goose down. It's the feathers from a goose uh, that create, it's great insulation. For anybody that, you know, lives in cold areas, apologies. But I didn't know what it was just because I had no... We, we don't have a ton of jackets down here. And it was 50% off, so it was $80 for this jacket. And, you know, again, I, I don't have a whole lot of money at the time. So I splurge, uh, you know, regular 160 or so. I thought, you know, at least it's half off. I get it, and it's an absolute game changer. I was wearing it last night. I've had that jacket for 12 years now. And I use it all the time or whenever it's cold, that is. Uh, it's really my adventure jacket. I wear it all, every time I go on a big trip. I take it with me because it's just been my tried and true jacket. So quality, there is something to be said about quality, uh, but there's also something to be said about uh, taking the stuff that you already have. Uh, the jacket was new. Everything else I had was pretty much either borrowed or used. So that takes me to one of my next points. You can borrow things. You can tell friends, hey, can I borrow this to try it out? You know, I'm not sure if I really want this thing, but I'd love to love to use it. There are so many people that have so much gear that use it maybe once or twice a year at the most and would be absolutely willing to let you borrow something uh, in exchange for, you know, maybe another favor down the road or just a you know, encourage you to get into the sport with them. Maybe they want to partner in this. So I would definitely do that. I've done that method. Another great thing is checking websites like steep and cheap, uh, where they have like a, you know, uh, it's like overstock.com, but for outdoor gear where they might have one item, a ton of one item, uh, and, and try to sell it at a pretty, uh, pretty highly discounted rate. I've gotten a lot of stuff off steepandcheap.com. Another one, I'm going to shout out our friends, Chap Grub and them over at rerouted.co. That's gear that folks are selling uh, that no longer want it or need it. 
And it's almost like, think of it like as a used outdoor gear yard sale online, uh, but high quality stuff at a great price though. There are some ridiculous deals on uh, on rerouted.co. So go check that out. Really love what they're doing because I'm also not someone that wants to just add a whole bunch of junk into the landfills. So whenever I get something, I want to have it for a really long time or I want to get it used to keep it out of the landfill and to give it another life. Uh, so if I can get something really cheap that's also, you know, high quality and already been used, keep it from been, getting thrown away, I'm going to go that route. I take that approach with almost uh, every adventure. And it leads to some really cool stories. You know, I love talking to people on this show who do some amazing adventure with, you know, their dad's backpack or their mom's bicycle or something from a family member that's been passed down. Or they do it with, you know, a $20 bike they got somewhere or, you know, something they find at a a yard sale. Like, I love those stories and I almost think it can add this really cool layer of, one, what's possible and two, the kind of stories you get out of the the adventure. I'll I'll go back to that trip on the AT, uh, the Appalachian Trail for a week. I ran into so many people who were going south that week who were finishing the trail really early because we were on the southern portion of the trail and uh, or, or or very soon to have finished the the entire through hike and so many of them had gear that uh isn't advertised because it's just stuff that they had laying around like it, it was amazing to see the amount of people that were doing the trip uh with you know a super old backpack just not even a sleeping bag a, a blanket and a tarp uh, and, it, and, you know, the, if you want that level of ruggedness with adventures, you can totally do it. And it can add to the experience, like I said. And the good news is with adventures, a lot of times, once you get that base level of gear, you probably don't have to add to that expense for a really long time. What I find to be really the ongoing cost of any trip are food, especially if you have camping gear. It it really is food. You know, outside of that, you're not buying a whole lot uh, unless you want to stay in hotels every night for your experience or something. But I'm not one to do that. Um, So one, if you can find a cheap way to get there or, or a deal or some sort of interesting, creative way to get there, that's a huge saver. Two, if you can really save on the gear somehow, that's another huge aspect of it. When it comes to being on the trail, the longer you're out there, the more basically efficient your budget becomes because one, you're getting used to the lifestyle and two, uh, you're, you're basically lowering your average cost per day down. If you have to fly across the country for a five day trip and fly back, obviously your cost per day is pretty high, but if you fly across the country, you're out for six months and you come back cost per day is pretty low. Understand a lot of us, myself included, are probably in more of that five day trip range right now. And even that is a, you know, a good long time for a lot of my trips. So there are ways you can, uh, you do this. One of the ways I do it is combine work and adventures. So anytime I travel for work, which is usually two to three times a year, uh, I add in an adventure. Most recently this year, I had to fly out to California for a, uh, for a work trip, actually two work trips, one weekend apart, both in California. And so instead of flying home the weekend between, I just stayed out there. And instead of just working remotely from California for a week, I took the week off or at least half the week off, uh, and backpacked that whole half week and did day hikes. The rest of the other couple days that I was also working, I couldn't, I would have taken off the whole week if I could have, but I had some like deadlines and stuff. But anyway, I was able to fit work and adventure and the travel really didn't come out of my pocket because, uh, the plane ticket was being paid for by my company. And so really the only expense was the gas that I used in the rental car, uh, for that week in between. And even then, uh, very inexpensive compared to what it could have been. And instead of staying in like in a hotel in Yosemite, which is where we went, we backpacked. And backpacking was, I think the permit was like 10 bucks or something. It was absolutely, totally inexpensive and self-serve because it had just switched to the winter permit system. And it was just like the most cheap trip you can imagine outside of 
the last the hotel we got on the last day, which is pretty it was like blew our budget up. <laughs> but it's all right because uh we needed it and I, I needed a shower before the next part of the work trip. So so though yeah, those are some basic tips. Let's see, what else do I have on uh saving on gear? Let's see. Yeah, so so before a trip, a great thing to do, something I've in- included is having an adventure job. And what I mean by that is uh, when it comes to saving for your trip, setting a goal, say you need to save $5,000 for an adventure, um, which includes, you know, travel, some gear you got to buy, all that. I get a job that go the, all the money from that job goes to that adventure and that's it. So for example, I once picked up a janitor job where I was a janitor at a, a school, an elementary school. Uh, and it was only at night because the school was closed. I could work and I was in college at the time, but also I did it after college too. Uh, so I would be at work all day and at night, a couple nights a week or three nights a week. And for a while it was like every single night I would work that job for three to four hours. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Two to three hours each night, mopping the floors, vacuuming the rooms. And I was by myself. I was listening to podcasts, absolutely loved it. And all that money I was making, which you know wasn't much, but I was pocketing it and I was keeping in mind, this is for the adventure. I'm scrubbing toilets. I'm doing this for the adventure. So I couldn't do that now with the responsibilities I have. But what I could do is allocate any money I make from this podcast uh, or any money I make from maybe some other small consulting gig or some sort of temporary job that I could find, you know, maybe a a hurricane recently went through here and there was all these little jobs that popped up of tree removal and, you know, lawn work and all sorts of brush removal, stuff like that popped up. And you can make a lot of money in a really short amount of time. You can kind of get those opportunities in your area. Maybe it's snow plowing. If you live somewhere that's really cold and just say, this money, this season is going towards this adventure. And that's a really nice way to separated from normal life, uh, but like mentally separated, but also motivate you to take on that extra, you know, level of responsibility versus trying to carve out small pieces of, uh, your, the work you already do and the budget you already have to allocate towards an adventure. So sometimes psychologically and mentally, that's really good. And that helped me a lot and still does. Another thing that I used to do, I'm just going to say this is just, I, like I said, I'm going to share some ideas of things that I think could work, but also I'm really going to lean heavily on things I've done. One thing I used to do to save for adventures was not only the side jobs, it was also raising money through uh, selling stuff, through basically doing a little, it was like a side job, but it was more like through yard sales and stuff. So what I would do is I would go to colleges at the end of their semesters. And if you know anything about colleges at the end of the semesters, there is a ton of waste going on. Tons of kids throwing stuff away because, you know, either they're international or they live somewhere really far away and they're going home for the summer. And there's all this stuff that they just accumulated in their dorm rooms or, you know, if it's near a campus, their their apartments uh, that they now don't know what to do with. And they would sell it to their friends, but guess what? All their friends are also going home for the summer. And so their entire community is pretty much leaving. And all those people are sort of in the same boat where they just have a bunch of stuff they accumulated. It's very natural. Like I I did the same thing. I just lived close to home when I was in college so I could take all that home for the summer. And it just goes to waste. Like they just There's dumpsters that they put out at the end of the semester and they just throw it away. And it's like... 50 mini fridges and pairs of shoes and lamps and all sorts of school supply stuff where they're like, it's not worth getting a short term rental, like a like a storage room for it, or a storage locker or whatever you call them. Uh, But it's also not worth trying to find a new home for all this stuff. So a lot of them just end up throwing it away because you know, school ends on a Friday, and they have booked flights for Sunday. There's not a whole lot of time that that leaves to think about, you know, they just finished their finals and now they got to fly out. It's really just pack the stuff I want to take home. The rest of it just kind of has to go. Well, I would go to those colleges with a big trailer and just load it up with the stuff that was valuable. Then I'd take it back home to where I was living and just do a yard sale. I would just literally that Saturday or the following Saturday, open up that trailer, set it all out and just sell a bunch of stuff to people in the town that I was living in 
which may or may not be where that school is because, you know, I, I went to a small school, so it wasn't like a college town where all the town was gone uh, when school wasn't in session. Uh, there was really, like, the town's still there, and all those people may or may not be interested in some of those items. So that was a great way that I saved a lot of money and made a lot of money for my adventures. And a bonus uh, that I will say, I did a lot of my adventures for causes, different nonprofits, and different, basically, did it for a bigger purpose than just me. And I would write that on a poster and tell people about it uh, and basically have some information about that at my yard sales. And people love that because they would read that when they walked up. I put it right at the front. They'd read it and say, oh, that's really cool. And when they went to buy something, say it was, you know, 10 bucks, they'd give me a 20 and just say, hey, keep the change, use it to go towards your cause. And it was a great way to fundraise for the cause that I was raising money for. And very often people would say, hey, I don't want this to go towards a cause. I want this extra, you know, $5 to go towards you. Like I know you need to have your, you know, like I know you have to pay to make this trip happen, this thing you're going to do. And I would try to honor that, especially if I knew the person, because that happened a lot. Um, You know, it was folks I knew in town uh, or they were just very adamant that, hey, you know, this and some people would give me like a hundred dollar bill and for a dollar item and say, Hey, keep the change. It was just their way of giving and getting something small in return from the yard sale. And so it was a really fun, organic way to meet a lot of new people, answer a lot of questions to just kind of market the idea of what I was doing and also raise money for the cause and a little for my own fun. Uh, again, all these trips, though, I would self-pay. Like I would pay myself, and the, the any money I would fundraise would go towards the cause. But a lot more people are willing to help you when you, you, they know that your efforts are going towards a bigger cause. That's a that's another thing that I would say is really helpful when it comes to paying for an adventure. Is if you have the heart for it or it's something you want to do. Uh, I know a lot of people take advantage of this model, but definitely fundraising for a, some sort of cause is an amazing way to one, get a lot of purpose out of it yourself, raise awareness for something you truly care about, make sure you care about it. And three, uh, there is often, especially depending on whatever cause it is, there is often a very extensive network associated with that cause that can lead to just so many amazing interactions, Uh, a family all over the world. A great example is like Say you're raising money on the Appala- – you're going to through-hike the Appalachian Trail and raise money for cancer research. Say it's around a foundation even. There's a foundation you know about. Maybe a friend of yours passed away or maybe someone you know has cancer. And you, there, There's this personal connection, which I recommend if you're going to do something for a cause. Make sure there's like there's something about it that you can really care about. That foundation, I promise, is going to be – really moved by your willingness to help them raise support and awareness. They're going to want to help in some way. They're going to put you in touch with some of the people that might be in the area. Uh, They're going to help you, assist you in any sort of fundraising efforts that you want to do. And there's just going to be a lot of goodwill passed back and forth if it's authentic. And that, let me please stress that don't ever use that model as a sleazy, you know, moochy way to get money out of people or to get attention out of people if you really don't care like it make sure it's something you really do care about and you really do want to make a difference with and (laughs) whatever you put into it is going to be given right back to you i'm just telling you i've seen it time and time again myself i've been blown away by the amount of connections the amount of just wonderful people i've met the the friends that i now have all through basically doing adventures for for different causes uh, and not not only that, but when the times get hard for your actual adventure, like let's say you're out there and it's been raining all day and you're going uphill and it just sucks and you're hungry and you're tired, you know, remembering you're doing it for a bigger reason uh, is going to really help you in those times too. At least for me, it did. Uh, not everyone's going to want to do that. I've done plenty of trips and plenty of adventures for absolutely no cause, like just for wanting to be out there. And I absolutely recommend that way too. That was, that's been a great way to do it. I, I've done trips just as long as my quote fundraising trips that were just about me doing an adventure and they're just as fulfilling as well. So uh, teach their own and it might just depend on the, uh, you know, the season of life you're in and what your 
going through. So just, you know, that's another thing that I, that I kind of like to throw in there. Uh, like I said, side gigs. Uh, yes, I mentioned janitorial work that I did, the yard sales. Um, if you can, tie in your job with your adventure or destination. So, uh, you, you know, a great way is like if you're if you're a ski bum, you work, you know, you want to do some ski traverse of the Colorado Trail, well, be a ski instructor or uh, work seasonally in a ski mountain to get kind of used to those skills and used to those people and be able to tell people about it, like like-minded people are going to know about it. And so, I, you know, any way you can overlap the two worlds to achieve multiple things is really helpful. Um, here's a big topic that a lot of people talk about is sponsorships. A lot of people want to get their adventures sponsored. And I have had some adventures that have been sponsored by different people. And I'll, and, I'll, and, he, and I'm going to give you a couple tips being on both sides of this. I've, I've done asking. I've done a lot of asking and I've also been asked a lot. And here's some things that I think it's important to keep in mind. One, when it comes to asking people to support your adventure, it's going to be different ways to approach it, uh, depending on if you're raising money for a cause or not. If you are, ask them to raise money for the cause. Like, start with that. Don't ever say, hey, the first $5,000 I raise is going to go towards my expensive or my expenses. And anything after that is going to go towards the, the, the cause. I did that in my first trip and didn't realize just how bad that looks. I was like 18 years old. So I didn't know anything then. Um, now I know don't do that. Like make the commitment that you're going to pay for the trip yourself. Uh, and just like at the yard sales that I was telling you about earlier, there's going to be people who are going to see that commitment and see that you're going to, you know, do your best to raise funds for this cause and they're going to want to come in on the side and just say, hey, please let me help you with your personal expenses for this trip. Um, and those are just going to be people who know you, people that care about you. It might be parents or grandparents or friends or professors. Gosh, I've, ha- I've had plenty of professors donate to my uh, adventures y- years after I was in school. Grandparents as well, family and all that. But uh, what was I saying? Yeah, so, okay, sponsorships. So Another thing is don't over rely on sponsors. Don't say, Hey, I'm you know going to plan this big trip. Uh, and sponsors are going to help me. No problem. I promise you, if there's someone you're thinking that is going to be a sponsor for your adventure, I bet a million people have asked them the same thing, you know, especially if it's a company that, uh, is crucial for this type of adventure you're doing. So if it's a backpacking adventure or some sort of through hike, think of, you know, a big backpacking company, they probably get pitched ideas 20 times a day about, Hey, can you sponsor my Pacific crest trail hike? Uh, and I'm just going to tell you, that's a really hard way to go about it because they get asked so often. It's really hard to get them to say yes. In my experience, uh, the best way to go about that is start with someone, you know, or start with someone, you know, that's doing it try to ask them, see if they're willing to share anything they've learned. Uh, if they're like me, I, I share anything. I really don't have anything to hide. I think the more we share, the more people know, the better. Uh, I'm an open book when it comes to anything I've learned or anything that's worked and hasn't worked. Uh, and I've always appreciated the folks that felt that way too. So, so yeah, making the ask towards a gear sponsor uh, can be really tough because they get pitched so much. So if you are going to go that route, make sure you have a really detailed, uh, basically outline or pitch deck that outlines what you're asking for, what they get in return, uh, when, and answers those questions very succinctly and very clearly. Try not to make it super wordy. Don't have your pitch deck be 20 pages. Make it a page or two. Uh, be very clear with what you're asking. Don't reach out to them and say, Hey, I'd love for you to sponsor my trip. What do you think? Like, don't try to make it very easy for them to say yes. Make them understand what you're asking the first email or the first phone call uh, and not have to keep following up because the more friction you create in that experience with them, the, the lower the chances of it actually happening are going to be. Um, just a word of advice, make it genuine too. start with who, you know, in the industry, start with people that, like I said, yeah, you actually know, start there, 
before you start doing cold calls and cold emails. I've done a ton of cold calls and cold emails, reached out to bike shops, all kinds of things, and with just total dead ends. But you start to learn a little bit as you go, and you start to learn what to say and what not to say. And you also learn who you want to work with. Not everyone's going to be easy to work with, even if they do say yes. So, you know, be careful about the folks that do say yes. If they make it very hard for you uh, to to fulfill what they've said yes to, uh, they might not be the best person to work for. So I'll lean on a personal story here. In my first trip, I reached out to tons of bike shops, seeing if I could get some gear. Because again, I was in college, I was broke. Absolutely nothing. And then one day... I didn't even ask. I walk into a bike shop. It's like two months before my trip. I still don't have a bike. I walk in. They're asking me, you know, I I asked if, hey, do you have any bike touring equipment? They say, yeah, sure. Just a little over here. And I'm looking at it and I can't afford any, any of it. And the guy there at the shop said, hey, what are you doing? And I told him about this plan. I, me and my best friend Paul had, we're going to fly to Alaska. We've already got plane tickets and we're going to ride bikes back. And the bikes we had were these old yard sale bikes that we had picked up. And I didn't make any requests. He didn't say anything. And a couple days later, I went back into that bike shop. I don't know why. I just felt like I should go back in there and look around again in case, you know, anything was on sale. I don't know. And Jason was his name, said, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad you came back in here. Dude, I really feel like, can you come back in the back with me for a second? I want to show you something. And he opened up a catalog and showed me two brand new bicycles uh, in the catalog and said, this is what you need. They're touring bikes. They were really expensive. Uh, They were beautiful. And I was like, yeah, I know. I need something like that. But, you know, I'm, (laughs) I'm, 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 I don't have anything. I don't have any money. Uh, And he goes, man, I just, I I love the cause. I love what y'all are doing. I really feel like we should give you these bicycles. And I was absolutely dumbfounded, blown away. Uh, Within a few days, they had ordered the bikes and they were there in the shop in a week. We got a week to ride them around before we had to ship them up to Alaska uh, because someone had decided to cover our shipping costs to get the bikes up there because they owned a shipping company. And, you know, like I said, don't rely, like don't plan on things like that happening But if you show genuine interest and if you show genuine heart, like you're going to go do this no matter what, people do step in and help where they where they are subject matter experts. And that shop was uh, Road and Trail Bikes in Highland City, Florida, for anyone listening. And the manager was Jason Brown. And to this day, I mean, that moment changed my life because we would have gone to Alaska and done that trip regardless. Uh, but whether or not we would have made it on the, you know, $50 bikes that we had found at yard sales or not, I don't know. Would have been a really cool story, but I really think something bigger was at play there of like, no, we, we really need to make sure the bikes aren't going to be the issue. It's going to be hard enough for us being so young and inexperienced. And that was just an amazing example of asking and asking and asking bike shops over and over and just like seeing if that method works and then not even asking one, and that's the one that ends up supporting us and sponsoring us. So, and to this day, uh, if I've ever needed anything bike related, I'll order it from Jason, even if it's not, even if I don't, you know, I got to ship it to me, of course, because uh, I don't necessarily live super close to there. So it's just a beautiful thing, and and it, and it goes to show, you know, seek and you will find, but. It might not be exactly where you're looking all the time. It might be the moment you stop looking that it finds you all of a sudden. So let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Uh, And that's another thing I do want to say. If you're going to, you know, pay for an adventure and not know how, you don't necessarily have to know how when you start, just start and things start happening. It's amazing when you, when you decide to do something, uh, you don't know how all the pieces are going to fit together. You don't know how life is going to balance. You don't know if, you know, family's going to be able to manage it or your job. Like, what is your boss going to say? What's your spouse going to say? What are your friends going to think if I decide to, you know, do this crazy thing I've always been, or I've been dreaming about. 
Uh, but what you'll realize is if people sense it's genuine and people see that change in you and see that determination in you, they start responding in ways you don't expect. Uh, sometimes it's the folks that you think are, sometimes it's like in a bad way, but a, most of the time in the way I'm talking about is people respond in a way that's like, hey, I think this is really cool and I want to help you in this way or I support you no matter what or just please let me know if I can do anything for you. And people start wanting to live vicariously through this adventure, Uh, the people around you that are close to you, and they're excited to see you do it. Um, Obviously not everybody, uh, but for the most part, people are really thrilled about the step of faith you're taking and kind of this, uh, jumping out of the nest, uh, that, that, it, that, it, that, which is what it feels like for a lot of us. And there's a ton of people that are just, they just have your back and it's really cool to see that. And it gives you a lot of motivation to keep going. Another thing when it comes to sponsors is, you know, making sure, like I said, it's really authentic. Start with who, you know, uh, and just make it as genuine as possible don't take it personal when people say no, you know, they, everyone's in a different situation financially. Some folks just, just can't do it. Some can, but they get asked so often or they just don't have the capacity to manage the ask or manage a yes even and, and you know, figure out all the deliverables. Ask often, ask all kinds of things from all kinds of people. One example is, uh, Again, when I was in school, gosh, all these stories are coming from school, I guess, because that's when the budget was such a big part of my adventures or whether or not I could do it. Now, thankfully, you know, I have have a job and a lot of my trips are short, so they're fairly inexpensive. So it's not as big of a problem making them happen. Really, the biggest problem now is just making sure I have that base level of gear maintained. You know, it's a tent, some sleeping bags, a kayak or a paddleboard. Once you have that stuff, you just kind of have it. So now it's really more about finding time than it is the money. Cause a lot of my trips are like 50 bucks. You know, I go camping for two nights. It's $10 a campsite or 20 bucks a campsite and we're split five ways. So, you know, it's, it's a couple bucks each and the food is just some stuff I grab out of the pantry cause it's a couple days. So really my trips now are extremely inexpensive compared to the income of compared to when I was in college and the income was very low and trips were still fairly inexpensive. It was just compared to the income. It was a lot. Now, if I was to do anything nowadays for an extended period of time, like a lot of the adventures we have on this show, I'd be right back in that same boat. Like, all right, how do I manage the time off with kids and with job responsibilities and also just the the expense of daily life. And that's another beast. But a lot of these principles that I'm talking about from school when I was in college or early days in my adventure or in my early adventure days would apply, would apply just like they would before. It's just in a, it's just in a larger scale. But one quick story I wanted to share about an unexpected uh, place to save some money was uh, I, I I went to a local Chick-fil-A and said, Hey, you know, I know y'all are really generous a lot of the times. And I was, again, I was in school and I said, you know, I'm going to be doing this trip up the East coast. I'm raising money to build this orphanage. Do y'all do any sort of sponsorship or anything? I wasn't like saying, Hey, will you sponsor me? But I was like, just inquiring at my local Chick-fil-A in Florida was like, Hey, do y'all do anything like that? And the manager said, you know what? We actually do. And he went back into the, you know, back of the back of the store, came back out and had an envelope in his hand. He goes, here you go. Uh, this is something we do enjoy and, uh, let us know how your trip goes. And I opened the envelope and it was basically what it was. I told him my trip was going to be 30 days. It was 30 free meal tickets for anything at Chick-fil-A, a a full meal, you know, a, a sandwich, a side and a drink, 30 of them, one for each day of the trip. And that, immediately cut out one of my busy, one of my only expenses on the trip, which was food every day. And so every day that I could, I got Chick-fil-A on that trip. And what was so cool about it is every time I went there, I would tell the folks there and they were like, Oh, that's so cool. You know, we, we heard about this or we're, 
uh, we're going to be following from now on your ex- adventure and see what other Chick-fil-A's you go to, but also see what other places you go and how much money you raise and all that. And I got pictures with a lot of those Chick-fil-A's and a lot of the managers wanted to talk. And a lot of times they would like give me a cookie or something. Uh, but it was also a great chance to sit down right about the day or post about some pictures and just either at the beginning of the day, if I was able to find a Chick-fil-A, get some coffee, uh, write about it, or at the end of the day when I was, uh, you know, able to talk about what happened that day. So um, that was a just a really unexpected and cool thing. And I was really impressed that such a big company like Chick-fil-A had that kind of infrastructure in place to help the really, 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 really small efforts as far as like the marketing efforts. Uh, and to this day, I was just very much impressed with that, uh, with that gesture and I'll support them. You know, I, 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 you know, don't, you know, don't get me wrong. I think Zaxby's has the best chicken sandwich out there and I love chicken sandwiches. Uh, but Chick-fil-A has a special place in my heart because they helped me, uh, that time. And on my next adventure, I reached back out to that manager and I let him know how this first one went. And he was like, oh, please let me know the next time you do that, we'll supply you again. The next adventure I did, uh, they also supplied me with some meals. Unfortunately, it was out west where there's not nearly as many Chick-fil-A's as the east coast of the U.S., that is. And so I didn't use a ton of them that time. Nonetheless, they were willing to support. So I, I just thought that was a really cool, unexpected place to save a little money, but also meet a lot of really interesting people, spread the message about the fundraising I was doing with this trip, um, and just, you know, have a really cool story to tell. So I I really appreciated them with that. And also, you know, speaking of marketability and getting the word out there, like I said before, anything is marketable um, from either time constraints to budget limits to the destinations you're going. All of that can lean into uh getting getting the word about your trip out there and here here's an example uh i was on a board one time or on the committee one time where i was the only person not in california on this committee i was i was i was in florida or i was from you know it said i'm from florida and i was like dang i was talking to my wife and i'm like dang i feel like a, a little bit of a fraud being on this board talking about this stuff or on this committee talking about this stuff where everyone else is from California or Colorado or something. And she's like, why? And I said, just because I feel like I don't belong there. She goes, no, lean into the fact that you're the only person that isn't from California. Therefore, you are much more memorable and marketable in the sense that, hey, there's that guy that's not from here, or there's that one dude that's an outlier. And I really learned a cool invaluable lesson that day is take any difference about your trip and lean into it, whether it be the reason you're doing it, whether it be the insane budget you're doing it on, like do it, literally do a trip and say, I'm going to spend no money. Like I've seen tons of YouTube videos that are like titled stuff like that, how to hitchhike across the U.S. on zero dollars, like make that a challenge even, uh, or say, you know, doing this on a budget with, you know, a family in tow or with a normal life, how can you make this happen? Like lean into the fact that make your constraints, the strengths about getting the word out there about your trip. If that's something you want to do, same with time limits, you know, like how to do the most insane adventure in the shortest amount of time, like beat Monday, the guys over at beat Monday, Jason Annan and Mike Chambers are a great example. They fit the most insane things you can imagine into a traditional weekend, 5 p.m. on Friday night, all the way till 9 a.m. on a Monday. Obviously, their budgets are really high because they're supported by Outside Magazine or Outside.com or the brand Outside, Uh, but they're trying to show you in an extreme way just how much you can fit into a weekend. And so use that to your advantage to see how much you can fit into a your weekend with your budget constraints and with your time constraints and with your destination constraints or say you know how how to have the most insane adventure really really close to home so there's all kinds of ways you can get the word out there or make your adventure kind of more marketable if that's going to be a goal of yours to make it marketable to you know 
share with others, I guess. Another way to pay for an adventure, and I feel like I've just been rambling for an hour, but I'm trying to follow some sort of guide here, is crowdfunding. Exchange something about your trip with others that they can purchase. So a great example is saying, you know, I'm going to bike around the world and take a ton of pictures. If you want to support me, you know, with a hundred dollars, what that guarantees you in the five years after I finish or something is a book with my favorite pictures, a coffee table book that you'll be able to share with others and say, you supported this adventure. And now you have this book, of these beautiful photos of places I went and stories I told, and I'll sign it for you. So crowdsourcing is another good way. I've seen a lot of people do some really creative things with uh, crowdsourcing and adventure fundraising. So if you have something that you think you could make really interesting about that and could get and also, if you only need like 10 people to support you at $100 or something or 50 start with the people you know, make them that promise, uh, see how much it costs to produce a book and all that. And if you enjoy taking photos, and maybe that coffee table book idea is something you could realistically do with your adventure and be a great way to share uh, the experience with others, especially the folks that help you support it. So that's just one idea. There's literally millions of ideas you could go with that involve crowdfunding uh, your adventure. It could be a book, you know, if you're wanting to write about it and like anyone that, you know, supports you with over $25 or $20 will get a copy of that book, a said book that you will be writing once the adventure is over. Try not to take on debt. Uh, That can really take away from an adventure. I know we've heard tons of stories about people starting companies and going out, you know, on a limb, taking a risk and, you know, putting, you know, putting money against their house, mortgaging the home or selling their home or all kinds of things like that. Just, just be careful with that kind of stuff. Cause it's, you're probably talking to someone who uh, is experiencing survivorship bias. And there's probably countless others who have also borrowed money against their home and it didn't work out so well and they lost their home and we, you know, they're not going to be telling their story necessarily all over social media. So you maybe have never heard of them, but they might account for nine uh, out of 10 times that folks try that method. Uh, and the one out of 10 is the one that succeeds and ends up, you know, telling everybody about it because it worked. Um, just be careful with taking on a ton of risk with making your adventures happen. One, it, you know, obviously really popular way to do it here in the States is just, you know, charge everything to a credit card. Uh, I don't know. This is not my method. I, you know, I kind of, if, if you know Dave Ramsey and total money makeover philosophy, I'm very much that philosophy when it comes to debt. Uh, I, I don't like debt. I try to stay out of debt. I try to live a lifestyle that, uh, keeps expenses as low as, as I can reasonably get them, uh, without, you know, really making Emily, my wife, super mad because <laughs> I can I can be pretty extreme, you know, I, the kids need clothes, I guess, I guess, and shoes, I guess. I think it'd be more valuable if we all learned to walk around barefoot, didn't need shoes. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm not that bad. But, uh, you know, if you can avoid debt, I would do it. And, and one thing, too, is staying debt-free has allowed me to do more and say yes to more things when the opportunity comes. And that's another thing. Maybe you don't know what adventure you want to do yet, but start working on some of this stuff in the sense of getting your lifestyle ready for when those adventures do strike. And, you know, sometimes there is an adventure where it's just not, it's not possible to save money on. Uh, Maybe it's something like hiking Mount Kilimanjaro where it's like, you know, you have to pay a guy. You have to have these permits that you apply for that cost a certain amount. It's not negotiable. Um, if that's an adventure you want to do, and that's the type of budget you want to work with, make it happen. Like you can absolutely do this, pick up side jobs. Maybe, you know, this formula, you can add or subtract or turn the dial on either end. You can save money on gear or save money on, uh, by getting a job or a combination of everything I've mentioned And I'm sure if I sat here and thought about it for another hour or two, I could think of an entirely different list of ways to to make adventures more possible. But this is what I was thinking, and this is what I had uh, the most experience with, uh, what came to mind first. But like I said, the last thing I mentioned, don't take on too much debt. That can really just 
just not be a healthy way of going about living your life and trying to fit adventures by just taking on piling on more and more debt. And that's coming from someone who, when I do have debt, it just eats at me until it's gone. But I would say, you know, keep an emergency credit card on you just in case. Just start making plans. That's the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, start making plans, start sticking to it, and start getting ready. And you're going to be surprised how things come together in really weird ways. And as you start getting ready, you may be surprised by some of the things that happen in life that seem that might seem like obstacles, whether it be like a death in the family or you lose your job or, you know, the place you were planning to go, the government shuts it down or something. Those things happen so often, but it often opens the door into something else that you didn't expect. And now the adventure you're going on is something totally, totally different than what you expected. But you're ready for it because you were training for the other one. And, and is that not adventure going after and following the unexpected? So I would say start making a plan. And so, so many things are going to start happening that you just don't know yet. It's almost like when you're looking at a map of a place that you want to go that you've never been and maybe you haven't even Googled that much. And you your brain starts to automatically think Whenever I look at a map, at least, my brain starts to automatically visualize what this place looks like. And, I'm, and I've learned now, it's always so exciting to actually go see the place because it's so different than what your brain was imagining. And that's how looking at an adventure ahead of time is. You know, you think, you visualize what it might be like, what you're going to feel, how it's going to look, all that stuff. Being out there is going to be so different and getting ready for it is oftentimes half the adventure. As you can hear, a lot of my stories and a lot of the stories I love and plenty I didn't even tell tonight don't come from the adventure itself. It comes from getting ready for the adventure. And if I had to put a number on it, I'm not going to say it's half the adventure, but I would say getting prepared for adventures is probably 20 to 30 thirty percent of the satisfaction of doing an adventure. That that's my experience and my opinion. Getting ready for it is a, usually a lot longer process than the adventure itself. And therefore you just have a lot more time in it. And there can be a ton of stories in that and a ton of just really amazing things that can happen in the preparation of adventures, not even on the adventure itself. And so I'd say that's at least where 20 to 30% of the magic is and 20 to 30% of your stories are going to come from and just the satisfaction of your adventure looking back. Uh, and, you know, that's that's probably consistent with, with uh, my experience. All right, folks, I have no idea if this was helpful. I went on for over an hour. I really feel like I just rambled on. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this again for a while. Uh, just but with all the questions that folks ask, uh, I just really felt the need to address money. And, and I am going to make the commitment that I'm going to ask more about money in the future. And just like, hey, how do you pay for this? What is your life set up like? What's your job look like? You know, what's your family? How do you, how do you, you know, you have a family. How do you, how do you do these trips? And so I'm going to try to ask more of those practical questions. And before we go to finish this all out, I am going to answer uh, the questions uh, that I had asked real quick from some of our listeners. Okay, I think I just got a couple that I'm going to answer real quick. Nathan asked, I would love to hear about strategies for saving for retirement and overall financial independence within the context of being a seasonal worker in the outdoor guiding and education industry. Yeah. So if you're seasonal, there's probably not a lot of, uh, you know, program set up for you in the sense of just automated programs to help you save and help you save on a consistent basis. The job I have now, my day job does have something automatic coming out of my paycheck that I set up. Um, if you're not having that, you just got to be more disciplined You just or, or just got to be disciplined about it. Like saying every paycheck, you know, 10 or 20 or 15%, whatever it is, goes into savings or goes towards a Roth IRA, which I recommend maxing out every year. Uh, no matter what you're doing, if you can max out your Roth based on um, your income, uh, which I think is like $6,500 this year, 
Uh, I, I'm, I'm no financial advisor, but that's one thing I do recommend doing if you're a seasonal worker and you're early on in this stage, uh, just at least doing that at bare minimum can really set you up for, for less headache down the road. Start, start that one earlier than I did. And I got that recommendation from Andrew Skirka, who was a legendary adventurer, still is. Um, but Nathan, if you have more questions, please reach out. I can't dive into the full statement you made, but I did answer some of that throughout the uh, the inter- uh, the episode. Then Joe, I've used travel hacking to fund almost all of my travel in the last 10 years. Passive income through real estate, these have helped me a ton. So yeah, travel hacking is basically just using credit cards and like the, the, the re- reward system in credit cards to earn tons of miles for flying and all that. Uh, you know, that's awesome. And I know that a lot of people that just comes naturally. That is not something I've ever done. Uh, I know a ton of people have done it and can do it, but th- that's just beyond my like level of organization. <laughs> Honestly, like I don't, I can't stay that organized and on top of things and I'll get in trouble. So I don't use credit cards a ton. And, uh, that's not a method I've had. Maybe we'll have to have, you know, a conversation about that and see what that's like, but that's awesome. Thanks for sharing Joe. And then Allie asks about tips about having adventures with kids. Uh, they take on their their kids on a lot of adventures, uh, but struggle with uh, keeping them motiva- motivated and whatnot. And so I'd say, Allie, that is actually something we should a- talk about. We've had other people on the show to talk specifically about how to have adventures with your kids. But as far as like paying for it, uh, you know, that that is definitely something that's a huge consideration when it comes to doing an adventure because kids are obviously another person to feed another, you know, set of gear, typically, uh, a lot of times more gear, depending on the age of the child. Like it's unbelievable how, when the smaller they are, the more stuff they need, I don't get it. And the bigger they are, it's just like, Hey, get in the car. Let's go. You don't need anything. Uh, so as they get older, you'll need less cost less typically, uh, in the sense of just the extras you'll have to bring with you. But yeah, I'd say one thing when it comes to adventuring with kids that I'll share is just changing your expectations. You know, don't set hard specific goals because chances are something's going to catch your kid's eye that you're not going to think about. So one great example, we went hiking not long ago and my son, like he didn't even want to leave the parking lot because he found a bunch of cool rocks in the parking lot. And so we stayed in the parking lot for like half an hour playing with the rocks. And, you know, I've been frustrated in that situation before, but I'm trying to go out and say, no, we're, we're, this is going to be, you know, if he wants to stay there right at the trailhead and play, guess what? We're out in nature. It's not the wilderness, but we're out at the trailhead on the trail in the woods Let's enjoy it. Or, you know, if he wants to go super far back in, you know, the 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 trail and stay there for a while, great. Maybe we don't do the full, you know, three mile loop I wanted to do. Maybe it's just a couple hundred yards in. It just so just really changing your expectations can be okay. And to me, if I'm just outside in nature, I'm I'm going to be happy. I don't have to like you know be doing a FKT or something. I, I just got to be out there. So that's what I've learned. And that's been helpful with kids, but all right, y'all thanks for the questions. If anyone else has questions specific to money, uh, like I said, I'll be asking every guest from now on, but if you have one, please let me know. And yeah, if you didn't like this monologue, don't worry. We're not going to do this again for a while until I have something else I feel like I need to talk about. All right. Well, have a great one. You'll be hearing from us on Thursday and uh, get out there and have some fun. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.
Today is your lucky day. You could redeem sweeps coins for a $50,000 cash prize at Chumba Casino. Join over 1 million players at Chumba Casino, America's favorite online social casino. It's your turn. Play for free at ChumbaCasino.com. That's C-H-U-M-B-A Casino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.